Hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today, I'm going to be breaking down how to play the Lord of the Hundreds, the brand new faction in the Marauder expansion for Root. Now, we have another video coming out, probably today as well, breaking down how to play Keepers in Iron, so hit the subscribe button, stay tuned. We also have a video titled The 13 Rules You'll Probably Miss even after watching this, right? So make sure you keep an eye out for all the coverage we're doing here on the brand new expansions. And with that, let's dive into how to play. Now, I'm gonna teach you as if you're a friend sitting across the table from me, because that's how I learn games. It's not going to be a long video and I'm not gonna go through every single nuanced question that you might have. Honestly, The Law of Root does a fantastic job if you're looking for specifics around pinpoint areas. In this video, I want to get you up and running, though, to walk you through how the faction plays, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and so that you understand everything that's happening on your board. Because the unique thing that Root does is it provides a way for you to walk through your turn just by reading through your stages. Alright, let's start breaking into this. The Lord of the Hundreds. Are you looking for an opportunity to raise the forest to the ground, to spread mobs of angry creatures across the landscape, burning villages, and destroying everything in your path? Well, fantastic. The Lord of the Hundreds is going to be just that. You're going to be commanding a fleet of furious rats, changing personality for your leader, and you're going to be on a rampaging warpath. The object of your game is to really establish control of regions of the forest where no one else exists. You'll have a lot of ways to do this, but primarily, you'll be collecting weapons uh, to give you more actions throughout the course of the play. You'll then be marching from your war camps and with your war leader uh, across the landscape, fighting and destroying other people and other people's items and artifacts. But you don't need to worry about destroying their buildings. Your mobs will do that for you. Your mobs are going to spread across the board as well, and at the start of your turn, they're going to raise everything to the ground. Anything that exists there will crumble into ash, and you'll be able to score victory points. Your strength is going to be found in your sheer ferocity. You're going to be able to spread, secure, and destroy quickly and efficiently, meaning that you can counter other big players, and you'll also be scary, or at least terrifying, to deal with. Your weakness comes... If your war chief gets taken off the board, that'll cause you to have a cycle where you don't spawn as much, you don't get to take as many actions, it's a little bit of a debuff there. So, if people are targeting you, that's your focal point. The good news is, that is also the most dangerous point of your army, that is the tip of your spear, and it'll take a lot of effort for people to take down your war chief there. Now, just like any root faction, your setup guide is going to be on the back of your board along with a breakdown of your character arc and kind of your win and loss conditions. I'm not going to walk through setup here, but I will note you're going to start with Stubborn on your board. The reason that matters is because Stubborn says this. In battle with your warlord, you ignore the first hit you take. That means at the very start of the game, people aren't going to like sweep in and just absolutely destroy your warlord immediately. From there, let's go ahead and talk about the top conditions of the board, the things that you should always read out to the other people who are playing the game. You're the true voice of this woodland. Dissenters will burn. The Warlord. Your Warlord is a warrior that cannot be removed outside of battle. Very important to remember that. Moved outside your turn or placed except with anoint. You cannot spawn him freely. You have to do so with an action on your board that we'll get to. Cannot be destroyed except in battle, and cannot be forced around, cannot be shoved. You have control of your warlord. Contempt for trade. When you craft an item, gain it, but score no listed points, or remove it to score them. And it does mean remove it from the game, meaning if you craft something, you get the choice to either get the action upgrade, because you're going to be collecting items that'll give you more actions both with your warlord and with your command, which allows you to move your troops around the board, or you're going to get rid of it to score those points. That's going to be a big decision you're going to have to make throughout the course of game. When do you sacrifice to get more actions or collect victory points, uh, but lose or sort of let your, your party, your warpath slow down? And then finally, at the start of battle, as an attacker, you may say that you're looting the defender. You deal no rolled hits, but they, but, but they do. At the end, if you rule the battle clearing, take an item from their crafted items. So, that means if you're fighting, 
you can take one item from an opponent as long as they have a crafted item. This cannot be the Vagabond. When you've successfully fought, you will roll the dice, they will deal hits to you, you will not deal any hits to them, and at the end of that battle, you resolve it by taking an item away. That item goes directly onto your board, which could mean you get another chance to strike them once more. It's something to think about. All right, just like normal root fractions, we're going to be following Birdsong, Daylight, and Evening, and I'll break down the specifics of how this plays as we work our way through there. Birdsong, at the very start of your turn, you're going to raise. At each mob, Mobs are going to be your little pitchfork and fire tokens. They will spread throughout the board, both by your control and outside of your control. Remove all enemy buildings and tokens. Take an item from any ruin, if any, and remove the ruin if it's empty. After resolving all mobs, roll the mob die once and place the mob in a matching clearing with no mob adjacent to a mob. With no mob, but adjacent to a mob. That's a lot of text there. What that's saying is at the start of your turn, your mobs are going to destroy whatever is in that location with them. Not meeples, but tokens. You're going to burn down the cat's buildings, you're going to destroy their lumber, you're even going to get rid of the ruins. The ruins will have items in it that you will take and place onto your board if you're able to, and if there was an item there. If you remove the last item from a ruin, you take that ruin off, and it's just another build zone for everyone else. You're also then going to spawn another mob. You'll roll the die, and you're looking for regions, so bunny regions, adjacent to an existing mob token without one already there. So in this case, the bunny regions we have are here, and the only one that's adjacent to an existing mob token would be the mob token here spreading up to there. Now, in the example I have here, we actually already have all four of our mob tokens out, which means they're going to remain exactly where they are. However, let me take one off. Let's say this wasn't on the board when I rolled that die. This mob token must now be placed up here in the bunny region. And at the start of the next turn, assuming the mob token is still there, everything there except for meeples is going to raise in flame and come crashing down to the ground. So, that's that first stage. Number two, recruit. Recruit warriors equal to the prowess in your warlord's clearing, then one warrior at each stronghold. Strongholds are going to be the buildings that you can place down at the map. They give you more spawn zones. They allow you to bring more meeples onto the board. And your warlord, which is the big rat with a flag here, is going to have a certain prowess. That'll be found over here on the horde board. You'll recruit based on that's strength. So the stronger you are there, the more meeples you get, the more your warlord can just traverse across the landscape, destroying everything. Third, anoint. Anoint a warlord if it is off the map, meaning through battle, through combat, it came off the map, you will then anoint or place one onto the board. Replace a hundreds warrior with your warlord. If you cannot, place your warlord in any clearing. Let's say you have no existence on the map, then you just spawn somewhere. But assuming you have meeples on the map, you'll pop one off, you'll place your warlord down, and you now have a new warlord. But remember, we just passed the recruit phase of the game, meaning if your warlord wasn't on the map, you won't get the extra meeples. Your hundreds will not spawn because they're waiting for a new chief to be anointed. Number four, choose a different mood. Here, you're going to be going through the various different moods that you have. Bitter, lavish, wrathful, rowdy, jubilant, grandiose, and relentless. And of course, stubborn, which started on your board already. One that does not show an item in your horde if you cannot choose lavish. So, what does that mean? Over here on our horde, we're going to be collecting the various different types of items from the region and from people who are crafting them. Every one of your cards here shows one of those items, except for lavish, shows one of those items up in the top left corner. If you already have that item on your board, you cannot take that mood. My advice would be to take it and set it off to the side as you limit the different personalities you're allowed to have. So, here, you'll choose one of these moods. It must be a different mood, and you'll place it down on your board. Read through the abilities, let the team know what you just selected, except for one condition. If you already have Lavish, or if you've chosen Lavish last turn, whatever the case, or you have all the items and you cannot play any of your moods, Lavish goes down on the board. Lavish is the only one that can stay there from turn to turn, but only 
and specifically if you cannot select other moods to play. And trust me, you'll want to select other moods to play. Moving down to Daylight, ending Birdsong, moving down to Daylight, craft using strongholds. These buildings are going to be your positions, whatever clearings they're in will determine what you have to contribute to a crafting action. Two, command the hundreds. A number of times up to your command, your command will be over here on the horde board, and so as you start getting more and more items, you'll see your command starts at one, moves up to two with two items, two to three items, three with four items, and four, uh, three with three items, and four with four items. So, uh, one thing you need to pay attention to over here is how much command do you have and where are you securing more items to get more command, which are more actions. The command actions you can take, move, battle, and build. Now, move and battle will be classic root rules. Those are things that are already established, but build. Spend a card to place a stronghold in a matching clearing you rule. So as long as you have rule there, these go up easily and quickly. You just need to spend a matching card. Okay. Advance the Warlord a number of times up to the prowess. You may move your Warlord with any hundreds warriors. Then you may battle in your Warlord's clearing. So once we get down here to Advance Warlord, we're going with the prowess. Prowess is going to allow our Warlord to actually move and engage with whatever hundreds are around him. So typically, you'll shift and shuffle and collect a lot of meeples here around your warlord, and then you'll go marching into the fray, taking down, kneecapping, or just decapitating some of your enemies along the way. And of course, spreading mobs if you can, or securing regions where mobs just spread to, because you want to make sure you score open plots of land. Next, evening. Done with daylight, moving to evening. First, in sight. Any number of times, Spend a card to place a mob in a matching clearing with a hundreds warrior, including your warlord, but no mob. So, this means you can start controlling where and how these spread. Again, burning down buildings and tokens that are there in that location. The important thing is, if you already have them all on the board due to your own control or due to randomness, you then don't actually get to control where they're going to move and spread because you can't summon one back up without a card called Bitter, in action, which will let you spend those uh, mob tokens to pull more units onto the board and collect them so you might be able to redistribute them if they've grown out of your control. So you can incite. You can spend any you can you can incite any number of times, and you can spend a card to place a mob into a matching clearing with a hundreds warrior. Now, along with this, if you incite in very disparate regions that are connected to a lot of different areas, you almost guarantee something is going to spread. So keep that in mind. You might want things to spread, or you might want to limit how many regions are going to be adjacent, meaning that you have a better chance at not spreading mobs on your next turn. And sometimes, sometimes that's very helpful. Number two in the evening, oppress. This is where you score your victory points. Clearings your rule that have a hundreds piece and no enemies pieces. It's important. As long as it has a hundreds piece and no enemies pieces, that could be your camp, that could be your, your mob, that could be uh, your warlord or any of your little uh, hundreds units, you're going to go ahead and score. You score for one and two clearings, you score one point, three and four, two, five, three, and six, you'll score four points. It's your main drive for victory points. And then finally, draw one card and discard down to five cards. Now there are other personalities that allow you to draw more cards, but really card draw, you're not gonna be very rich or wealthy when it comes to cards. So don't overspend too quickly. Be tactical with when and how you actually place your cards down. And that's the core. That's kind of the crux of how the hundreds play. Your main objective is to spread across the board, score victory points by dominating and getting rid of people. You'll want to control maybe a corner or a large landscape and really push up to five or six regions that are in control once you've established good domination of an area. Once you've burned something to the ground, the odds of people wanting to come screw with you there get less and less as the game progresses. They've kind of set up their own objective and their own camp, and so leaving a few mobs behind will usually do a pretty decent job at guarding you. And the tip of your spear, 
Your warlord there can be absolutely brutal if you put him to you if you put him to task at the right moment and in the right location. I've seen people raise the ground with him, just spreading over the landscape. But if he does get taken out, that is the best way for opponents to debuff you. Outside of just stepping into clearings and knocking off your mob tokens, which will score them a victory point, of course, so don't leave those two vulnerable. Having your warlord need to be respawned really does take the wind out of your sails for around a turn or so. So, there you have it. The Lord of the Hundreds. Hopefully you enjoyed this how to play. And make sure you hit the subscribe button because we have a lot more coming out.